So I've been going back and uh, going down an Asan Reddick rabbit hole, unfortunately, which, which brings me to an awful place because there's no new deal with New York. There's no new deal with the Jets. And I started reading, you know, going around, whatever, and I actually – I don't read the Inquirer as much as I used to, um, especially since the season ended, since the football season ended. And we're going to get to the Phillies and how terrible that was last night for – not just the game, but the rain delay. I don't know. Both teams had the day off today. From what they said in the broadcast last night, the Reds didn't want to play on the off day. I, I don't know. I, I think it's awful to do that to fans. I understand the run of business and all that, but it just annoys the hell out of me. Because I've I've been there, and unless you're like a college kid, like for me again, which I was at the time. Actually, one of the rain delays that they put up on the screen last night is one of the longest rain delays ever. I was at, um, and yeah, then it was fun. But now I think about it, I'm like that would suck. I don't want to be held hostage, essentially. But anyway, no. Uh, I'm watching the game last night, and it was very disappointing. We'll get into it. Uh, John Tortorella's press conference, I think, was an anthem for head coaches in Philadelphia. I played for you guys, like Jason Kelsey, talking about what it means to play in Philadelphia, and I think that's a great thing. Uh, John Tortorella, I think, summed up why I believe he's a great coach. And I, he summed up why, uh, of all things, I didn't expect him to be, like I thought, maybe this is a cushy retirement gig for John Tortorella. Why the hell would he want to take over the, the, the Flyers now? You know, But he has been every ounce of John Tortorella, every ounce of into it, and every ounce of making sure that he gets the most out of his players in every single moment. He's got six games left in the season to try to lock up his playoff spot, and he's trying to get his team over that hump. Yesterday was an optional practice, and that's when he addressed the media for about 15 minutes, and I think he gave an answer that every single head coach that comes through Philadelphia needs to hear, and I thought he was honest. I thought he was fair. He took responsibility for himself as well. If you didn't hear the comments the other night, if you're not the biggest hockey fan in the world, how about the biggest coaching fan in the world? Because what John Tortorella said after the Flyers game earlier in the week was that they embarrassed the Flyers uniform. All right. <laughs> kind of puts the cards out there on the table. Well, he doubled down on it yesterday. We'll let you hear what he had to say. But I got to start it off with this Asad Reddick stuff because it really is bothering me that the Eagles defense, and maybe it was yesterday I did a hit with uh, our buddy uh, Bill Calarulo. And before that, I did a hit with our friend uh, Dan Cilio. And they got me thinking more and more about this Eagles defense because I'm not one to just dwell on football and just think about it all the time. You know, I do uh, like other sports. But this Hassan Reddick thing has gone from being in my feels to just being in my brain. And I caught myself even last night during the Phillies game, letting my mind wander uh, just as there was, you know, no offense. And Zach Wheeler was pitching, pitching pretty well. And I started thinking about the Eagles. I started thinking about Hassan Reddick. And I guess it's living rent-free in my head right now, as the expression goes. But the Eagles, I believe, even if Vic Fangio decides that uh, Hassan Reddick is going to be dropped back in coverage at least seven times a game, which was his most, and we've made a hell of a lot of that number, of course, I still want Hassan Reddick here. Because it goes back to the original thought that I had, which was if you're not going to be sending a lot of blitzes you at least want to know that your outside linebacker or at least your edge rusher can uh, be able to get after the quarterback and win those one-on-one -on -one battles I've said it a million times and I still believe that I still want to sound Reddick here even if there's a philosophical change in Eagles defense and then I went back and I listened to some of his press conference and I listened to him about being aggressive and then this story came up <coughs> from the Inquirer not from yesterday not from the day before not from last week but from February 28th, and I read the uh, the thumbs up and thumbs down that came out the other day on the Inquirer. Uh, I read that yesterday, too. Uh, Olivia Reiner had a thumbs down. EJ Smith had a thumbs down. And Jeff McClain, God bless him, Jeff just had the meh emoji. Hands up in the air. I don't know. I don't know. You know, that emoji. Whenever I'm about to send it to somebody, which is very few and far between, it's usually my passive aggressive, like, maybe we should do this. You know what I mean? Every once in a while when I play the role of someone who could kind of be passive aggressive uh you throw it out there and uh jeff mcclain threw that up there as his emoji for thumbs up thumbs down he gave meh and i i started reading the story and jeff is in the same boat that i think a lot of us are in and i'm in this boat as well which is 
if there's no deal signed, no extension signed with the New York Jets, then why did the Eagles make this deal? The only thing that would make sense, the only thing that would make sense is if the Eagles weren't planning on paying Hassan Reddick Four point five million, or excuse me, fourteen, fourteen point five million in the upcoming season, and they wanted to save that dough. I, I, I had, I heard if they were going to rework it, he would have stayed. I heard if they were going to rework it, it wasn't going to be for necessarily uh, substantially less money over two years, just more guaranteed money up front. He wanted a new deal. He alluded to it in training camp when Jeff McClain, by the way, asked him the question, and I had forgot about that. Because Jeff McClain, oh, he started, he started a little scuttlebutt with people about uh, Sean Reddick and whether or not he wanted to do it. Uh, you know, I'd heard he did want a new contract. Do you want a new contract? Well, you know, I, I think I'm a pretty good player, blah, blah, blah. But, but here's what really jumped out to me in the story. Chasing sacks. So, in other words, stat padding. And it wasn't just for Sean Reddick. It was Josh Sweat. Now, Josh Sweat. His numbers took a huge hit at the end of last season. And then what happened in this offseason? He got a he got a new deal, and he's going to be around for a little bit here. Hassan Reddick did not get a new deal. Now, what's the difference between the two? Well, uh, obviously, Hassan Reddick is a much better football player. Obviously, Hassan Reddick has already had uh, sustained success in the NFL. Why would Josh Sweat get that deal and not Hassan Reddick? Now, Josh Sweat, eh, a little younger, right? But... I don't remember Josh Sweat saying anything damning in the locker room throughout the season. And I find it very interesting that, to quote Jeff McClain and the story, he cites two sources in the in the Novacare complex about Hassan Reddick, quote-unquote, chasing sacks. Two team sources suggested, suggested during the season Reddick and Sweat appeared to be chasing sacks at the expense of the defense. Why is that story coming out after the season? If I if I hear two of my best edge rushers, two of my best aggressive football players are going out there and they're chasing first off thought that was their job, so damn them for doing their job and then the the idea of chasing sacks like in other words Swinging for the fences because you got a, a big contract bonus if you get to your number. I can't fault a player for it necessarily. Yes, you ultimately want the, the 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 goal to be winning football games, but that just struck me as odd because since the season has ended, here's what we've gotten. Okay, we have gotten a Son Reddick wasn't even speaking to Sean Desai. That was one story. We got that uh, it's not Reddick. You figure you could get a better deal. Yeah, you, you you go seek a trade. Now that's. That actually happened, so we know that's true. Uh, and a story came out in February about a Sound Reddick chasing sacks. I, 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 the more I don't want to believe that his when was it December, December tirade. I hate to even call it a tirade because it was like he was yelling and screaming. But his December airing of grievances about the defense and changing from. Uh, the, the, the side to Patricia, and that's what the higher ups wanted to do, and him snickering at the idea of being dropped back seven times in coverage and all that. I can't help but think the team just really, really, really did it like that. And maybe Howie did a great job of not uncovering their feelings behind the scenes. Maybe they let it leak out in a story like that about chasing sacks. He's all about his numbers. He's not about the team. Well, I thought if he gets his numbers, the team does a lot better. So what is it, his fault that James Bradbury couldn't tackle on the outside? Well, you know, if Josh Sweat wasn't going for a sack on that play, maybe you got to tackle. What? No. So you're telling me that a guy wanted to do his job, and that was at the expense of the defense. I thought his job was to get after the quarterback. I thought it was to rush a player or rush a quarterback into mistakes. So I, I just, I'm really having trouble because the money aspect of this, as of right now, doesn't add up. And as Jeff McClain wrote about in the story, there's no deal here for the New York Jets. If and when it happens, bigger emphasis on the if it happens. 
Because I don't think if you're going to be moving a, a guy like Hassan Reddick, I don't think you're moving him unless you know you're moving him into a, a happy camp for himself. The picture I use in the thumbnail, by the way. Oh, God, I hate it. And I didn't want to use it, but it, it's, it's just too perfect. He's like smirking while he's at the podium in the Jets press conference. He got in a lot of great stuff. And it, it, it sounds like I'm listening to him up there. I'm like, man, I like a player like that here in Philadelphia. I caught myself thinking that for a split second of a split second. And I went, oh, damn it. <laughs> he was just here in Philadelphia. Uh, I, 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 I'm very curious to see what Vic Fangio has. There's a report from Cilio as well about uh, Son Reddick and Vic Fangio having a conversation and, and Son Reddick uh, not exactly being all in on a Vic Fangio-style defense when I, I still can't help but go back to the idea that he's just been in a Vic Fangio-style defense and he's just had back-to-back, though. He's been back-to-back double-digit sack seasons in a Vic Fangio-style defense. I... I... It's a, it's the it's the only move really of the offseason that has made me go, eh, not great. I, I thoroughly believe that it's not even an opinion. I think it's a statement of fact that the defense had a lot more work to do this offseason than the offense. The offense, I think, bulked up. You put in, I'm sorry, hold on a second here. You're going to have these wide receivers, that tight end, one healthy, and you're going to have a Saquon Barkley? Okay. All right. I, I think Camp Jurgens can play. You know, I, I think Tyler Steen can play. If not, Matt Hennessy's right there as well. All right. Let's, let's get cooking here, fellas. But defensively, if you're going to be moving more to a 3-4, if you're going to have Jalen Carter now as an edge rusher, if you're going to have Jordan Davis as your nose tackle and Brandon Graham move back to outside linebacker a la the Chip Kelly, Billy Davis days. Did you have Billy Davis on your bingo card today? Well, then I have some concern. Uh, Safety-wise, look, uh, read blanket chips here, fine. Uh, I, I'm, I'm still thinking that if the – if it's not Reddick's not – signing that deal or signing a new deal with the Jets and the Eagles aren't um, and the Eagles are just saving four and a half or $14.5 million. I have to think that there's another big deal coming. The optimist in me is saying, well, there's gotta be something else here that the Eagles want to do. And they we're going to restructure that deal with Hassan Reddick and maybe give him a two year deal with more guaranteed money up front again. And they're going to manipulate the cap that way when how he waves his magical mystical cap wand at the salary cap and goes, I know how to find some money for Justin Simmons. But when I think about that, they had 32 million under the cap. He could have done both. Uh, so that's where I'm at right now as far as the Hassan Reddick deal goes. But defensively speaking, you had a lot more questions than you did offensively. I, I uh, uh, Offensively, I just think that they are, are going to be a force. And I really hate the idea that with the strategy being their strongest defense is going to be a great offense. All right, that's going to be fun, and I know fantasy owners are going to have a lot of fun with that. But I, I know this city. I know you guys. Okay, the, the offense is going to be a lot of fun. But if the defense is allowing thirty points per game, that offense is you're going to be sweating out a lot of games. Unfortunately, sweating out a whole lot of them. So I saw that story come up again, and again, it was from February, and I went, "Oh my god, what is this? How do you, how do you have that?" statement from sort maybe you only got it from one source then you got the second and that's where you could go with it i don't know but damn chasing sacks that's a it's a bit of an indictment when you come to that smear campaign for a sound reddick oh we wish him well we wish him well nick sirianni howie roseman and uh jeffrey Lori, all at the owners meetings in orlando florida talking about how great a sound reddick is not going to comment on contract but he's a great player Oh, yeah, I understand he's a great player, which is why I would like you to comment on the contract. <coughs> Drives me bonkers, folks. Drives me bonkers. Hey, uh, the uh, Philadelphia Phillies played a, a baseball game last night. The game was originally scheduled from 105. They moved it the day before to 405. And then they moved it to 8 o'clock. It's not, like at some point, you still consider the fan. I, the game I was at where it, the rain delay was insane, and they put the graphic up last night when the game actually started, and the game that I was at was yeah, it was against the Reds, June 
14th, 2004. Also against the Reds, okay? I was at that game. Me and my buddies had just finished a baseball road trip. We were driving back down from Boston. We hit a couple stadiums, you know. Um, driving back down from Boston, and we realized that Ken Griffey Jr. was about to hit his 500th career home run. So we were at Cask and Flagon behind Fenway Park. I, mean, I was in, I was going into my senior year of college at Temple University, you know, the Temple University. And we were looking up at the TV, and we are like, oh, wait, hold on. Griffey's about to hit his 500. Oh, he's playing in Philly tomorrow? Oh, my God. So we, we, we downed our last drinks, went back to the hotel, passed out, drove to Philly early in the morning, made it down there. We were at then McFadden's, you know. We are having a great time, having some drinks. And I remember my dad called me and said, um, hey, did you see Griffey's not playing tonight? I said, what? <laughs> he goes, yeah, Griffey's not playing tonight. I go, this is before Twitter. You know? I'm like, oh, boy, great. But Jim Tomey was about to hit his 400th career home run. So we got to see that. And I remember there was an hour and a half rain delay. Um, In the, I want to say, third inning. Then he got a couple more innings in. And then there was another hour and a half rain delay. And it was three total hours of just goofing off at the ballpark, just waiting for um, things to to get going. I, I forget who it was, um, but it was an insane game. I, you know, Clay Condry wasn't on the team yet. Maybe he was. Um, but uh, it was pretty insane. It was pretty insane. But if you're not a college kid and you're going to the game, how are you having fun <laughs> waiting four more hours for a baseball game to start? That's bonkers to me. But they started at 8 o'clock. For whatever reason, they really wanted to get the game in. Uh, um, I saw Todd Zalecki of the of uh, MLB.com say that there was a wet so there was a rumor that started up about a wedding taking place today at Citizens Bank Park. They had to get the game in today because of a wedding scheduled at Citizens Bank Park. Todd Zalecki said there is no truth to that rumor. I didn't even see the rumor, but thanks for telling me, Todd, because this is hilarious. And he says, there's no truth to the rumor. There's no wedding tomorrow. What a world we live in. And that's what Todd's like he said. My first reaction was, Todd, why do you hate love? Second reaction is, that's a hilarious rumor. So anyway, they decide they have to get the game in. So they get the game in last night. And when the game actually started, to actually talk baseball now and not rain delays, Zach Wheeler was masterful. Ten strikeouts. He did give up hits in unfortunate situations. <laughs> Certainly, that's the case. But there was no defense behind him whatsoever. And again, no run support. The only run you got was Kyle Schwarber's home run, which was an absolute bullet to right field. That just, unfortunately, maybe in this case, I shouldn't use the word bullet because it tattooed somebody right in the gut in right field about four rows back. It was the only run the Phillies got. But Bryson Stott had an error. JT Real Muto had an error. Harper had a couple of misplays there at first base. It was just bad. It was bad, unfortunate baseball. And in the right field corner, I said this while I was doing post game last night. I, I was, I said it jokingly, snidely. I don't know. Is Nick Castellanos having a problem with the scoreboard in right? Because Nick Castellanos over the last year and World Series. Okay, so I'll, I'll put it to you like that. So since the World Series against the Houston Astros, all of last season, he's been a pretty good right fielder. All of a sudden, out of nowhere. It's like, imagine, magically, all of a sudden, Nick Castellanos since it's swinging and flailing away at low outside sliders and pitches and curveballs and fastballs and all that stuff. Imagine all of a sudden, just doesn't do it anymore. Well, all of a sudden, he became a really good right fielder. And then this year, I'm watching him, I'm like, he's lost. What the hell is his problem? slow slower than slow could be all right i i would still love here's what i would do if, if i had a time machine okay <laughs> that here's my here's, here's what I, do. I would i would take nick castellanos back with me and i'd have him race pat burl prime pat burl just because i'm so curious yeah all the other things that's happened in the world no no i need to see pat burl race nick castellanos because i need to know who's the slower corner outfielder for the phillies okay so I'm watching Nick Castellanos chase down fly, uh, the ground balls out there in right field. I'm, I'm watching him try to chase down fly balls that are hitting off a point in the wall that he can just reach up a catch. And I know the wind was bonkers last night, but this isn't the only game this season that he has played like this. And I know the season is young, but this is rather scary for Nick Castellanos. 
what was it steer that put the ball in the corner last night whoever it was he had took four days to get to that baseball somehow magic just amazingly he did lay off one of the pitches last night and he actually worked a walk he worked two somehow um but just him in the field looked slower than usual for Nick Castellanos. That, that's not a great thing. So not a lot of support at the plate or in the field for Zach Wheeler. And did he give up the untimely hits for himself and the timely hits there for the Reds? He certainly did. But 10 strikeouts, one earned run over six innings of work. He's got a sub-1 ERA in his first two starts of the season. Record-wise, he's 0-1. He's a loser. Gotta love the way that works out in baseball. But last night was extremely frustrating when watching that team play because with the bats in their hands, they had nothing to offer. In the field, both teams, the, the Phillies came up with the errors there, but both teams looked like they were really struggling with the weather conditions. Bryson Stott's error at second base early in the ball game that was worrisome because it actually ended up coming around to hurt the Phils in the third inning. Martini had the error, or Martini had the little dribbler up there to uh, Stott at second base. Stott couldn't handle it, boots it, so you get the leadoff runner on. Wheeler comes out there, he strikes out Stevenson, so he does his job, gets him on a sinker, and then India gets hit by the pitch. So you have an opportunity here to have two outs and a runner on first. Instead, you have one out with a runner on first in this instance. India was given uh, Wheeler fits in his first two at-bats. Uh, worked full counts in both of them. He walked him in the first one, hit him by, uh, hit him with a baseball there in the third. Uh, Wheeler was down in the count 3-0 and actually ended up fighting his way back. Then he gets the out there with Benson. As Benson gets the little dribbler to Bryce Harper, who shoveled it to Wheeler for the out. It would have ended the inning. Unfortunately, it was only the second out of the inning. You have second and third with nobody out. Encarnacion, uh, Encarnacion Strand steps up there and puts the, the look. Uh, Wheeler put a fastball up there in the zone. Very hittable pitch. One, two fastball. I guess he tried to sneak by him. Encarnacion Strand. Longest name in Major League Baseball history, by the way. Uh, he ends up putting in the left field for a two-run double. So was that on Wheeler? It absolutely was on Wheeler. But he could have had a little help if the leadoff runner never got on. Uh, JT Romuto dropped one behind the plate. Uh, Stott had that play. Like I mentioned, Harper had a couple misplays at first. One of them ended up not hurting the fills. And then just an absolute, I don't know, slow as molasses, Nick Castellanos in right field was very troublesome. Here's what really bothers me, though, about last night's game. Bryce Harper has the three home run night Tuesday night, including a grand slam. After the game, when he was asked about what he's going to remember, do you remember what he said? This is what he said after the game. Appreciates like baseball history and just milestones and achievements. Can you kind of appreciate three home runs on a night like tonight, including a grand slam? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, didn't really shoot. You know, wasn't really sure if we were going to play this game tonight. Obviously, and uh, anytime you're going out there playing in that cold weather, um, it's, it's not very fun. Um, but getting the first one out of the way and kind of getting those runs on the board um, was really big for us. And that uh, collectively, we had pretty good at bats against Ashcraft and. Then Suter came in and shoot. Uh, he went on to say, sorry, I thought it was in there. Uh, he went on to say that this was the game that he hopes starts them on a rip on the way to the World Series. What he was talking about was momentum. He was hoping that last night, him saying, all right, boys, get on my allegedly injured back and let's go. And that's what he did two nights ago. Last night, he had a hit. Everybody else who got a hit, they got a hit. That was it. Schwarber, the only big hit. No timely hits. Uh, there was no momentum. That's the biggest thing that sticks out to me about last night's game. You had such an emotional game when it came to Bryce Harper carrying your ass, all right, that you thought maybe you built a little momentum against this Reds team. No momentum. Momentumless. That's what it was last night. I was hoping it would be a little bit of a jump start. Hey, oh, 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 you win your first series of the season? Then you got the Nationals? All right. Six-game road trip, including three in Washington and then three in St. Louis. All right there, Phils. Get it going a little bit here. Give me a little early momentum. Don't give me that, you know, typical slow Philly start. Let's get it going. None of it. None of it last night. And the biggest opportunity <coughs> that the Phillies had was in that sixth inning when they finally got on the board. 
Now, previously, uh, De La Cruz in the top of the sixth inning had that uh, RBI double down the right field line. 1-1 one, one curve that was hung up in the zone a little bit there, again by Wheeler, unfortunately. And uh, Nelly De La Cruz went down and got it, put it in the right field, and it ended up being an RBI double. <clears throat> uh, before that, Fairley had the double off the wall over Castellanos' head. I guess he just lost it. I don't know. But it was two outs in the inning, in the top of the sixth inning, when they got that little bit of lightning going for themselves, a little bit of two-out lightning for the Reds, including that De La Cruz RBI double. And then he had his 10th strikeout of the season, or 10th strikeout of the game, uh, Zach Wheeler did, when he struck out uh, Steer. High fastball, blew it right by him. Beautiful thing. But still, 3 nothing at that point. Going to the bottom of the sixth inning, Schwarber has that home run, line drive to right field. Then Turner strikes out on a high fastball. Harper grounds out back to the pitcher. And then Real Muto goes up there, and he puts a single in the left center field gap. Stott steps up. He works the walk. Beautiful thing by Stott in that he was facing um, Montas last night. Montas throws him, I think it was a, a curveball, and Stott flailed at it. Missed it horrifically. He goes down the count 0-1. Montas goes back to it for the second pitch of the at-bat, and that time Stott recognized it out of his hand, laid off the pitch. It was in the same exact spot. Good discipline there by Stott. He ended up working the walk there. So you have first and second with two outs. You're hoping for a little lightning. Somehow Castellanos laid off uh, another uh, uh, pitch there, low it away. Amazing, but it happened. He works the walk. Bases loaded. Two outs. Down two runs. Montas gets taken out of the game. They bring in Wilson, the lefty, to face Marsh. Marsh hit 229 against left-handed pitching last year. He gets called out on strikes. Goes down looking on a high slider. Uh, excuse me. No, <clears throat> that was later in the ball. Um, he flies out, uh, pops out in foul territory to third. Remains a 3-1 ball game. That was the real last opportunity the Phillies had to get something going for themselves in the ball game. Rough. Absolutely rough to watch that game last night. And again, the thing that sticks out to me above anything else, it's all about how this Phillies team built on no momentum from Bryce Harper's three home run night the previous evening. And that's really what sucks. Uh, after the game, Rob Thompson was addressed in the media. It'll come. You'll have nights like this. Also, by the way, one correction. I didn't realize this until I think it was Taryn Hatcher that told the story on last night's uh, during last night's game. Uh, Taryn Nicole. Uh, was uh, telling the story of Ricardo Pinto. I thought Pinto was in Lehigh Valley, and he hit traffic and came to uh, Citizens Bank Park and was late because of the traffic. She told that he was at, he was with Lehigh Valley, but Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs were in Rochester, New York. And then he gets like, "Oh, by the way, we're gonna need a we're gonna need a relief arm tonight." There, Ricardo Pinto. Uh, how about you come on down to, to South Philly? Okay, so seven hours from Rochester, New York. All right, seven hours, drives down. The driver gets lost around the, st of all places, seven hours, gets lost around the stadiums. And Ricardo Pinto has to meet the Phillies traveling secretary at the center field gate. You could not be further away from the Phillies clubhouse when you're at the center field gate. You can't be at the ballpark and be further away from where you got to be if you're a player. So he meets him at the probably the probably the, the ticket takers, whatever, are like, oh, you need to take, oh, he's with the team. What? Okay. Yeah, you go in. He walks him through the crowd, down the elevator to the clubhouse, puts on a uniform, walks by Rob Thompson. Hey, don't skip. Goes to the bullpen, throws a session, goes out into the game, throws four innings. She can't make this stuff up. I've heard of players being late. I haven't heard of them having to walk through the stadium. I'm at the center field gate. Can you come get me? Okay. Uh, so that's where we're at. Phillies have the off day today, and I think we all need an off day from the Phillies. While they're off today, though, before I get to John Tortorella, the 76ers uh, are in an interesting uh, situation. They got the Miami Heat tonight. They're going into Miami, still waiting on status for both Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey. I would hope with uh, Embiid getting the day off today, the team getting the day off today, not playing, that I would hope he'd be ready to go come tonight against the Heat. Maxey is still the bigger question mark as far as I'm concerned. But what did I tell you yesterday? The Sixers' remaining schedule is the easiest schedule in the NBA. One of the, one of the teams that the Sixers have 
on down the list here. So tonight they got the uh, Miami Heat. Saturday they got the Memphis Grizzlies. What did the Memphis Grizzlies do last night? They beat the Milwaukee Bucks. So wouldn't you just love it? After beating, or excuse me, if they beat the Heat and then fall to the Grizzlies, who just all of a sudden hit a stride. Now, the the, the thing here is, the saving grace for the uh, Sixers in this is that um, uh, the, the, the Grizzlies beat a Doc Rivers coach team, which isn't. Which isn't difficult to do. Uh, but all right, hold on. Wait, there's more. The Magic, the second to last game of the season, the Orlando Magic uh, are playing. Now, I'm sorry, the Pistons, third to last game of the season. The, they do play the Magic second to last game of the season. But on uh, next Tuesday, they uh, host the Detroit Pistons. The Detroit Pistons had a, a little interesting thing go on last night. They had um, 68 bench points last night. All right. 68 bench points for the Detroit Pistons. Malachi Flynn, who went into last night's game, I believe, averaging in his career, 25 years old, five point, I think it was 5.2 points per game. Last night, he dropped 50 off the bench. 50. <laughs> so, let's see. The Grizzlies, supposed to be one of the worst. All right. Easiest schedule in the NBA for the Sixers. The Grizzlies just beat the Bucks. Now, the Pistons, they still lost. I mean, that's what they do. Uh, but now, maybe Malachi Flynn is going to be a thorn in the side of the Sixers as the season winds down. I say that half kiddingly. But, of course, this would happen to us, where this easiest schedule in the NBA, guys would all of a sudden start looking like players. Uh, but that's where we're at tonight. Sixers are in Miami. Take on that Miami Heat team. Uh, as of uh, as the standings go right now for the Sixers heading into this game tonight, the Heat actually jumped above the Pacers with the tie break. So the Heat are actually in the sixth playoff seed right now. The Pacers, who lost last night, they're still a uh, game and a half up on the Sixers. They're at 17 and a half games out of first. Sixers are 19 or 19 games out of first. Well above the Bulls, uh, but still it obviously has major impact on the standings to win this game against the Heat. Help your own cause. And that's what I'm hoping the 76ers do tonight. Uh, hopefully you get Maxi back. Hopefully you get Embiid in the lineup, and we'll see how uh, one game under his belt back since January 30th. Uh, he'll be uh, up and running and ready to go. Uh I, I know a lot of people don't like, you know, they don't buy into what people say. I always find press conferences, interviews to at least give you a little bit of a view into the mindset of what a person is thinking. Because um, obviously you have to think thoughts and think words before you actually say them. Now, whether or not you got to filter between those two things, and I sometimes don't, uh, is another thing. But I think it at least gives you a window on what the people are thinking. So John Tortorella unleashed the hounds the other night when talking about his Flyers team and the piss-poor effort they had in the second period of their most recent game. Tortorella went out afterwards and literally said that they embarrassed the Flyer uniform. The way they came out against the Islanders there and ended up losing that game 4-3, to three, their fifth consecutive loss, uh, flirting with missing the playoffs now with six games left in the season. My thought is it's his last-ditch effort. Saying that to the media was his last-ditch effort to try to get players' attention. I'm sure he has said it in the dressing room. I'm sure he said it to guys individually. I'm sure he said it at practice. The Flyers held a uh, volunteer, voluntary practice yesterday. You bet your ass you better be there. <laughs> the man, uh, Voluntary? Sure. I don't think so. I don't believe you even a little bit when you say voluntary practice for the Flyers right now. So John Tortorella holds this voluntary practice with the Flyers yesterday. And it looked like, a, from what I saw, a good amount of players showed for everybody for the most part. And they got a game tomorrow night against the Sabres. They're in Buffalo. So they get this practice in yesterday. I don't know if it was before or after practice. John Tortorella takes to the microphone to address the media. And he gets asked about his comments after Tuesday night's game against the Islanders and whether or not, you know, he can be seen as a guy that might be a little too hard on some of his players. John Tortorella, I think right here, 
gives a beautiful dissertation on what it takes to be a professional head coach. And I think this is all this is something that all Philadelphia coaches should hear before they take over. And really, look, as much as I'd like to say just Philadelphia, if you're a sports fan in general, you want your coach to have this attitude. Here's Torts yesterday. This comes down to, right? It always comes down, oh, they're going to quit on him. It, it follows me around. It fo- it fo- and so be it. If a player is going to quit on me or players are going to quit on me because I'm trying to make them better people and better athletes, you got the wrong damn coach here and you got the wrong damn people here. So I'm not sure what goes on. My job is I am going to push athletes. And um, I try to stay away from uh, – I have other things on my mind that I don't give you. Uh, I was in control the other night. What I said I meant, and quite honestly, when I watch the tape now, I'm, I'm more concerned than just the second period. Because of – I'm so proud of the team – getting here and and I guess now the narrative out there is because I've heard from other people that they're young they they're not supposed to be here bullshit we're here we're here face it and let's be better and I don't think we're ready to be better and that's my problem with us right now and it is my job I have not done a good enough job to get them over the hump after playing those seven games, and then each game as it goes down, we have six left. I haven't done a good enough job to make them understand we have to be different now. We have to be at a different level. That's my frustration with me, and that's my frustration with the team. <laughs> if you want honesty and accountability in your head coach, that's him. He is him. He's that guy. How do you not? I love that. And. The fact that he's talking about it's his job to make these players realize it, I have zero doubt. You think that you think the press conference is the first time those players heard uh, his criticisms, his critiques of them? No, they're hearing it in practice. They're hearing it in the dressing room. He takes accountability, saying that I got I I have to do better than of making them realize it. He hasn't done it yet, <clears throat> and when he's talking about. People saying, oh, it's amazing that you've come this far. BS. I got to honestly, and you guys know, this has been my take on the Flyers all season. You know what? Just give me a good season. Show me production. Show me guys getting better and you know, stockpile some assets for the future and all that stuff. That's all I'm asking for. Well, I have gotten that. And I am about to get more. I might even get, we might even get playoff hockey still. I hope we do. I am who he's, my mindset is the mindset he's talking about that people have. Hey, you don't come this far. Great job. He's like, no, no, no. We still got six games left. Do you, do you, you still six, six games left. Do you want to be a playoff team? Do you want playoff experience under your belt? Do you want to know what that feels like for someone you haven't experienced that? Do you want to know what it feels like again for some players have only experienced maybe once? Let's get back to that. No, there's no puppy dogs and ice cream story here. There's no cute little fairy. Oh, this is so great that we may. Oh, we can, we got close to making the playoffs, and no one said we would. Oh, no, now that you're this close, finish the job. That's what he's saying. And I absolutely love hearing that because you want that mentality from a head coach. On a totally different uh, end of the spectrum, like, could, could you imagine in like the first year of the process, <laughs> Brett Brown saying you know, things like that? Like, no one's expecting well, the hell with it. No, because he knew the deal. John Tortorella knows the deal as well. You don't win, you get fired. He wants to win. He also knows that what he, he also knows what he signed up for. There'd be a little bit of a rebuild here. But now that it looks like this rebuild is on an expedited process where you still might be in a rebuild year and make the playoffs. What? He doesn't want these guys to miss out on that opportunity. And I love everything he had to say yesterday. I think it's dead on accurate what he had to say yesterday. And I want my I want every head coach that comes to the city of Philadelphia to have John Tortorella's mindset. He's not just going up and mouthing off without players hearing it. Those those players, has anyone come out and been like, oh, that's the first time? That's the first time hearing John Tortorella thought our effort was terrible. And I love that he doubled down on it. I love that he said, you know what, after watching the tape, it was actually more than the second period that we sucked. 
It was more than the second period. All right, the sucked was me, not him. But it was the, the, I love that it was more than just the second period. I, originally, he gave a very specific, very specific pinpoint criticism of the second period. The way we play the second period, it embarrassed the sweat out. I, I, lo- I love that after a while. You know what? After the tape, uh, after watching the tape, we sucked a hell of a lot more than just the second period. We were terrible. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that is, um, that's the coach I want, folks. You want accountability? With a little, with, with some notes of entertainment? <laughs> John Tortorella is that guy. Flyers back at it tomorrow night against the, uh, the Sabres up there in Buffalo. So that's where we're at right now. Let me tell you about the people at MyBookie. MyBookie.ag. Take advantage of all they have to offer at MyBookie. MyBookie.ag. You want to bet on the world of basketball? You want to bet on the world of hockey? You want to bet on the world of baseball, maybe? You can do it all. At MyBookie. MyBookie.ag. Download the app. Use promo code FARSI. It'll get up to $1,000 redeemable cash bonus at MyBookie. MyBookie.ag. Also, uh, you don't like uh, betting in the world of sports? Maybe television's more your thing? You can bet on the world of television. You know what else you can do? You can bet on the world of politics. If that's your thing, you can do that as well. Uh, go to MyBookie, MyBookie.ag. Download the app, create an account, use promo code FARZY, and you'll get up to $1,000 redeemable cash bonus at MyBookie, MyBookie.ag. How about the Game Time app? Want to go to the game? You do that on the Game Time app. You want to have yourself a good time at the game? Make sure you do it with the Game Time app. Flash ticket deals. Uh, uh, last minute ticket deals, even ticket deals for an hour after an event starts. You can do it all at uh, Game Time app. Uh, use promo code Farzy when you download the app, create an account, and get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Twenty dollars off your first purchase at the Game Time app. Uh, real quick, looking at the uh, NHL standings here. <clears throat> Flyers are holding on by a thread. Versus the Carolina, uh, Carolina Hurricanes. Obviously, that'd be a tough draw, but that's where they're at right now because the Flyers are in third place in the Metro Division. The Rangers and Hurricanes have already locked up a playoff spot. Flyers looking to do that as well, but they're one of the top threes in the Metro. And in the wild card, uh, they're one of those three teams in the wild card. So that's where we're at right now for those Flyers. Uh, let's get into the chat chat. Oh, before I do, let me tell you about PHL Sports Nation, Philadelphia Sports Nation, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience across all social media and blogs. <sighs> that's social media. That's uh, phlsportsnation.com. Let's get into the chat to check and see how you're doing. Daniel, what's going on? IBH, Sean Kilrain, what's going on? Whoa, Carlos Dew, what's up, man? Yo, Farsi, good morning. Coming out of Knoxville, Tennessee from a Southern Eagle. Carlos, I will be in Knoxville, Tennessee in one month. Um, <clears throat> my uh, my nephew, my wife's nephew, to be more specific, but my, yeah, my nephew uh, is a freshman at Tennessee. And um, I don't know if I've told you guys, but um, my wife's family, they like it a booze. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we're going down there, me, my two brothers-in-law, um, my wife <laughs> and uh, their wives. We're going to Knoxville college experience <laughs> i was not i was gonna not go i was just gonna tell my wife you just go you, you go i don't i mean she's like i'll die i'll die because you know i'm gonna try to out drink my brothers and i'm like well that's a beautiful family rivalry you guys have uh um, and they are they're great they're they're partiers man the first had a bunch are a, a, a more of a reserved bunch <laughs> but yeah i would be down there and partying try i'm sorry did i say party trying to party trying to party uh, buddy Christ, we're gonna need you that weekend, buddy Christ. Be with us, please. John Tortorella needs to use his words of wisdom to Chiriani. Sean Kilrain would love to see it. Buddy Christ, kind of tired of hearing about Reddick. So am I. I'm in my feels. I'm tired of talking about it, but I just I gotta get it out. I gotta get it out. April, and I know people are still pissed about it. until April. Good morning. Until until. <clears throat> until a contract is announced an extension with the jets or justin simmons is signed or another big move is made it's just not going to make a whole lot of sense to me 
Uh, Buddy Christ, to answer your question from the other day, I'd have booed me back then, too. I'd have booed me, too, back then. I spent an entire day in a cave eating Doritos and watching YouTube instead of getting on with saving humanity. Thank you, Buddy Christ. I know what? I did see this one great meme. Um, uh, one of the one of my favorite memes that I saw on Easter was, uh, you know, Jesus died for our sins, right? Uh, it was the meme, but it was like, but really, he, but he came back. He came back for our sins. So, like, he just took a weekend off for our sins. <laughs> and I'm like, why didn't I ever bring that up to the nuns? Right? When they were telling me Jesus didn't really die, he ascended, right? Then I should have been like, well, hold on a second. I thought he died for our sins. But he didn't die. Oh, whoa, 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 sister. I got to call some. I got to call you on this one. <laughs> That's what I, I should have said that. And then I would have been thrown out of school. And then my mom would have been really pissed. <laughs> hey, you told me. You told me. So essentially what you're really telling me is you just took a weekend off. Uh, I imagine any Catholic school kid such as myself that saw that meme went, oh, why didn't I say that in school? Well, we knew the reason why. Uh, eternal damnation, obviously. Uh, Ratchet, what's going on? Uh, this uh, is what Howie does. He tries to tarnish people's character uh, when he makes BS moves and the fan base disagrees with. Again, here's my problem. The story came out February about the chasing sacks. The story came out February fifth, uh, February twenty eighth. The story came out February twenty eighth, and it was like a throwaway line in the story. Like, let me see if I—I uh, I just have that part of the story saved. Oh, geez. Okay. Oh, uh, come on. That's not it. Um, Rob Thompson, by the way, did say after the game um, that Nick Cassianos is bothered by the scoreboard. Sorry, I forgot to mention that earlier. Uh, when I was telling, when I was talking about how I was joking that he, now I'm seeing it in my note. Um, I don't think I got that line in, but uh, the story from Jeff McClain came out February 28th, and it's like a throwaway line deep in the story. So I, I don't really understand how that happens because that's a pretty big indictment. That's a pretty big accusation. <laughs> Babs, what's up, Babs? Stat padding is hurts running all the time uh, from in close instead of rewarding the running backs with uh, simple handoffs and touchdowns. That's the only time I really hate the tush push. It's like first and goal from the one, and you're going to just – I'd rather a running back just do it rather than my quarterback. <laughs> Nolan Smith better ball out this year. He's why they made the trade. Howie banking on another first round failure over a proven star. Huff is going to play with Reddick here or not getting paid 17 million. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, Bryce Huff was going to be paid here in Philly regardless of what happened with Reddick. Yeah, probably. I just don't like I forgot Nolan Smith existed. Like someone had to remind me, well they, they must also have confidence in Nolan Smith. And I was like, "Why?" Like he's so far removed from my brain. I'm like, "Why? What did he do last year that made you go, that's a first round pick?" Oh, yeah, shoulder, he had a shoulder problem. Oh, really? He's had the shoulder problem for a while. Somebody mentioned bum shoulder about Nicobe Dean, and he got bumped down to the third round. So where's the Howie genius move there? Uh, like Big Sill says, Howie goes shopping at the dollar store, defensive players. You know what I don't like about the Vic Fangio defense while we're on the subject? Here's what I don't like about the Vic Fangio defense. Here's what I hate about the Vic Fangio defense. It is a concession. I think one of the reasons people run it and one of the reasons it's become very popular is that it concedes to the idea that the league doesn't give a damn about defense. Now, you might say some of that is smart, okay? Realize that you don't have any rules that benefit you. So just say to hell with it and try to uh, try to prevent the big play. Try to uh, allow an offense to have a lot of plays to move down the field where they're likely to make one mistake and you can capitalize on it. 
that's the thing that I that just drives me bonkers. It's a concession. It's um, not not exactly like, but similar to if a if a pitcher in baseball just said, you know, it's hard to hit a baseball fastball, 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 fastball. It's like taking something for granted. It's taking for granted that an offense is uh, offenses in the NFL have <laughs> every advantage over the defense. So just don't allow the big play. Don't allow a lot of scores. I'll allow a lot of plays. Don't allow the big one, though. That's a concession. That's what I don't like about it. And through our experience with Jonathan Gannon, to a degree, Sean Desai, I hate the idea of not ever forcing a player that can be forced into mistakes, never forcing them into a mistake by actually having a blitz, by having, actually having a palpable, to use Sean Desai's word, a palpable pass rush. To just let teams sit back there and make plays, you're just making it easier for them. That's what I don't. That's what I don't like about it. Now, the other side of that argument is that last year the Dolphins set that sack record, that franchise sack record, with Vic Fangio as their defensive coordinator. So, and the Eagles under Jonathan Gannon, not sacking, had seventy sacks. Or excuse me, not blitzing, had seventy sacks in the season. So, there's other ways to get pressure on the quarterback, but that's where you're depending on one-on-one -on -one battles being won. Bryce Huff hasn't played more than forty-one percent of the snaps. So, I, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I hope he's ready for that next step. Sam Rex, the guy that plays 70, 74% of the snaps. I know he was ready for that. Nolan Carroll is another unknown. It's just that even more so now because of the money tied up, Bryce Huff better be ready for this promotion. So that's what gets to me. Buddy Christ, thank you. Love that you're doing the locked on Phillies post game. Connor Thomas is always so positive. Uh, Connor's all I knew Connor when I was at the Fanatic. Um, kind of refreshing in comparison to the typical Negadelphian fan base. When is he coming on this for you? I yeah, I'm gonna get Connor on this program. We need to get Connor on this program. Um, yeah, Connor hosts the daily Phillies locked on podcast. I'm doing post game locked on podcasts and web shows so catch me on youtube people um and you could do that and you can watch me after the phillies game i'll be on after the sixers game tonight uh, on the locked on philadelphia sports youtube channel so don't miss me there big game we're talking about it uh, but yeah i'll get connor on at some point uh connor's great though big fan of connor i actually just because i just started doing this for locked on uh, they had Connor and I on the same call uh, for a little meeting, a little Philadelphia meeting, okay? And uh, I didn't know Connor had never met the boss before. <laughs> so my typical dumbass self, Connor logs on, and I'm just like, Connor, you handsome bastard, how are you? You better be wearing sleeves. And he was like, yeah, I'm wearing sleeves. And then I guess the boss was a little taken back, and uh, I was like, oh, wait, maybe they don't know each other. <laughs> Scoozy. Uh, um, like Connor, basically Connor was trying to be professional and I'm calling him a handsome bastard and questioning whether or not he's wearing sleeves because he's known to not wear sleeves. Uh, so there you go. Anyway, unpopular take, but Rob Thompson is the problem on this team and he's cost the Phillies more time than I can count. Hutch, you might not be wrong. You might not be wrong. <laughs> April, is that moonshine? Is that moonshine? IBH. Why isn't that working? Now things aren't working. That's annoying. Then yeah, now there we go. Towards the classic kickoff. Mihai! What's going on, Mihai? Nice to see it. <laughs> if they would have brought if you would have brought that up to the nuns, they would have beat you silly. I just missed, I just missed like the abusive um like getting smacked around by the nuns. That wasn't I don't think that was our generation. April, did you get that? Because all I got was uh eternal guilt. Like my parents, my mom in particular, she got smacked around. You know, every everyone got hit in those days, you know. Um but my my generation was I think our generation was more as that, well, you're just going to go to hell. 
I didn't sharpen. I I need to sharpen my pencil. You should have sharpened it beforehand. Uh, but I didn't. Well, enjoy hell. That was kind of, that was kind of. Uh, it might be a slight exaggeration. But Sister Stanislaus I told you guys about my Baltimore connection. The one nun name that I still fear to this name this day is Sister Stanislaus. What a great name, Sister Stanislaus at um, Sacred Heart of Mary in Dundalk, Baltimore, essentially. That nun, I I will still wake up in cold sweats. First off, I think she lived to be 120 years old. I'm pretty sure she lived to be 120 years old. To steal a line from a comedian that I can't remember, she knew so much about Jesus because she hung out with Jesus. Okay, that's how old she was. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't be saying that, Sister Davis Uh In my day, they beat the hell, uh, beat you half to death. Oh, here you go, Carlos. It's laid back down here. You'll have a good time. I've been to Tennessee a couple of times. I've hit uh, Nashville. I've hit Memphis. Nashville a couple of times, I think. Yeah. And then Memphis. And then uh, I've never been to Knoxville. I am. <clears throat> Here's what I notice about any time I'm <coughs> down south, so to speak. I am such a East Coaster. <coughs> Scusi. I am 100% East Coast. Just Northeast, specifically Northeast corner of the United States, Philly, Boston, New York. That's my life, man. That's my pace. And I get very frustrated um, when things aren't quick, man. The only time that's different is maybe California. And if I'm anywhere in Europe, which pretty much has that type of mindset of just kind of relax. But then I'm on vacation. I don't care. So it's a little different. <laughs> Christopher Drakeford. Uh, word is Jeffrey Lurie is selling the organization for a dollar. Fire Howie Roseman. I could see it. I could see him selling it to his son for a dollar. Just because for some banking thing. I don't know. Uh, Rob at Temple. Farzy the Fit. What's up, Rob? I don't appreciate it. Nice to nice to see you. There's one more thing I wanted to comment on a little bit more. Uh, I don't know where it is. I must have missed it. Oh, yeah, here you go. IBH, Phillies and MLB basically poo emoji on the fans yesterday. They're taking NFL lessons. Possibly. Possibly. Thanks, to everybody, in the chat. You guys are great, as per usual. Um, so, yeah, let me get back to something here with Nick Cassianos. Uh, but first, let me – there you go. Um, yeah, get rid of that. Um, let's get the morning rush. Brought to my Sky Motor Cars, skymotorcars.com. So Rob Thompson saying that Nick Cassianos told him the, the scoreboard's been bothering him. That has to be – the lamest excuse I've heard for an athlete. Like, of all the excuses, we've heard some stuff. Okay, we've heard for who, for what? Hey, I don't want to get my head taken off by a defensive player in the early 90s when, you know, defensive players can do whatever the hell they want. So, like, I at least get it in a way with Ricky Williams. Ricky Waters, excuse me. Um, Nick Castellano saying the scoreboard is bothering him. Bro... If the scoreboard was behind the batter, okay? If the scoreboard was behind the batter, I'd get it. But the scoreboard is behind you. When you're running out there, and like like the, the Nelly De La Cruz double, you're running that down. The the steer double, I think it was as well, or single, whatever it was. He's running that down in right field. Are, is, are you looking? Are you looking at the mod? Are you looking at the screen as you're running that ball down? Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't be shocked if Nick Castellanos had my family guy brain, okay? If he's all of a sudden, you know, look, there's a baseball squirrel. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if he was like that at all. Um, But that's pretty damn lame. That's pretty damn lame. Uh, Phillies have the off day today. Sixers are at it tonight. Did I say 7.30 start time tonight in Miami? I feel like it's a 7.30 start time in Miami. It is a 7.30 start time in Miami. Two, three, four, five, six games left in the season. 
Good times. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. You guys are great. As per usual, my name is Mark Farzan. This is the Farzi Show presented by MyBookie, mybookie.ag. Hey, I'll be back with you guys uh, on uh, YouTube tonight after the Sixers game. So we'll recap all that fun stuff. We'll do a half-hour show on the uh, Locked On Philadelphia Sports YouTube channel. So make, make sure you guys subscribe. It's in my Twitter. If you guys just want to find that, you guys can uh, click on it and follow and have all, all sorts of fun stuff. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'll be back with you guys tonight and then tomorrow morning right here on the Farzee Show, uh, presented by MyBookie, mybookie.ag. Thanks. See you later. <laughs>